In this section, we are going to talk about reflecting telescopes. And these are telescopes that use as their primary focusing device mirrors as opposed to lenses. Now, this image hither is a picture of the Subaru telescope owned by the country of Japan. And it has one very, very large, beautiful curved mirror. When you have a reflecting uh, telescope, this is a modern version of what was originally designed by Sir Isaac Newton back in the 1600s. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, as I mentioned earlier, there's only two kinds of telescopes. There is the one improved upon by Galileo and then the one improved upon by Newton, or excuse me, invented by Sir Isaac Newton. In a Newtonian telescope, often they can be identified by the fact that the eyepiece often is off to the side. Um, there is a lens, excuse me, there is a mirror down at one end. Light comes in from distant objects and that light is then focused by this curved mirror brought to a secondary mirror that bounces the light sideways into the eye of the actual observer. That's a simple Newtonian telescope. One of the contemporaries of Newton was a gentleman named Cassegrain. And Cassegrain made a slightly different design on the Newtonian reflector. Um, in this one, light comes down the shaft of the telescope. The secondary mirror is in the body of the scope. The light hits it, and then it comes back through an actual hole that is in the objective or first mirror. Uh, these kinds of reflecting telescopes, the observer actually looks through them just like you would with a refractor or lens containing telescope. Reflecting telescopes have been the, the workhorses of astronomy for many, many years, for a hundred years or so. Uh, this is a picture of Edw Edwin Hubble, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about him when we get to our section on galaxies. But this is the telescope at the Hale Observatory in Mount Wilson, California, where Hubble worked and did an awful lot of his discoveries. Um, here is the objective mirror down here, and light comes through the end, reflects, secondary mirror, and then back through the eyepiece. Some of the advantages of this kind of telescope is that the mirror that is at the back of it or bottom of it is unlimited in size. It's only limited by the physical constraints of building a really, really, really large mirror. Um, and the focus occurs because of the curvature of this mirror, the light comes to a focal point on that mirror. And then the secondary mirror is in place to send that off to the sides for that eyepiece. Some reflectors are made with just one large mirror. Um, this is very expensive, makes perfectly beautiful astronomical observations, but if there is a damage or a boo-boo in that mirror, one fraction of the size of a human hair, it will make the astronomic observations slightly blurry. So this is tricky and hard to do. It is much easier to make multiple small mirrors, and as you can imagine, much, much cheaper to do this. Um, and then these all work together with computer controls to act as if they were one big mirror. Some reflecting telescopes use little hexagonal uh, flat plates, and these little flat plates, if one gets damaged or broken or has a slight imperfection on it, this is one of the cheapest ways that we can build big reflectors uh, that is easily fixable. Uh, and so that's kind of the way the world is going. One of the defects that occurs in a reflecting telescope is something that's called spherical aberration. And spherical aberration not only occurs in mirrors, it also occurs in lenses. If you take a fraction of a circle, you have like a basketball, and you slice a piece of it off and treat this like it was a mirror and it's silvered like a mirror is, 
any light that comes in is supposed to focus back at the focal point or focus. The challenge is that's not mathematically what happens. Um, a lot of the light waves focus where they're supposed to, but light that is on the outside edge, right on the far edges of this mirror, miss the focus. And what that means is the actual focus ends up being slightly blurry. And you don't want a big astronomic telescope that's blurry. This is a collection of example pictures for spherical aberration. Everything is going to be just a little bit out of focus. Here is Big Ben in London with that spherical aberration and without. Um, here is, I don't know where that is, maybe UN, I'm not sure, um, a little blurry, and then without that spherical aberration. Some astronomic images. As spherical aberration increases, the images get less and less crisp. So how do you fix that? Well, instead of using a dish or a mirror that is a like a cut-off piece of an actual sphere, like a basketball, instead we use a mathematical shape that is called a parabola. Those of you who have done some math, I'm sure you have sketched parabolas in some of your math classes. The focal point in a parabola is much more crisp. The beams and rays that come in close hit that focus, and the ones at the far outside edge hit that focus. Uh, so there's a tendency towards these parabolic reflectors instead of just circular ones. Now you've actually seen parabolic reflectors all over the place. Inside of a flashlight, you have in that flashlight reflector around here, um, at the focus point, there is the glowing light. And light comes in, hits the walls of that reflector, and then when it reflects, it reflects out perfectly straight. And this light bulb is actually at the focus. It's one of the ways that they actually contain those beams of light in a flashlight and get them to move in nice straight lines outward. If you have a satellite dish, this right here, that's the focus. The light comes in from the satellites a long way away. Wherever it hits the dish, it focuses back onto that focal point. That turns into an electrical signal, which allows you to watch your favorite TV show. Another way of correcting spherical aberration, and this is a way that is used commonly in cameras, um, is by making the field of view smaller because the beams that are in the center of the lens or the mirror focus really nicely. It's the ones that are on the outside edge that have the most spherical aberration. So if you're messing with a camera, what happens is that you close the aperture. You make the holes smaller and smaller and smaller to eliminate the beams that are going to be weird and out of focus. You do this when you squint to make things look clear. Um, I do not have perfect vision and I can't see that well sometimes. And without my contacts or my glasses, if I want to see something more clearly, if I squint, I am doing the same thing. I am cutting down the beams of light that are less focused and just lowering it down to the ones that are nicely focused. Okay, that is going to do it for this section. And uh, we'll see you next time.